Welcome to Mentoring Moments. Mentoring Moments is a sub-series of the E-Commerce Edge podcast. It is composed of clips taken from Jason's one-to-one and group mentorship sessions. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Mentoring Moments. I'm here with my man, Evo, and he's got some fantastic questions as part of his agenda with me today around SaaS platforms and SaaS pricing. What do the models look like? How do we make sure we're we're covering our costs and making money? How do we make sure that we are competitive in the market? How do we make sure that it is sustainable and scalable for our business and that we don't have massive administration overheads in the process of operating our pricing model and our data structures that need to back that up and payment systems, et cetera, et cetera. Evo, I'll let you set the stage for this and then we'll launch straight into the Q&A session. Cool. Jason, thanks very much for having me again. Really looking forward to this mentorship session, SaaS pricing. See, although we do have our pricing fixed or set, right, it was still in, it's still important for me to, let's say, go back to the drawing board and see, okay, maybe there are some elements that, that we never considered or things that are also preferred from a client's point of view, right, to take in the client's perspective. So, hence, I wanted to bring up this this pricing model conversation with you today. Maybe we can kick it off with the different pricing models that, let's say, most used, since there might be thousands, but maybe we can focus on the main ones just to have a scope in this conversation. What do you think? Yeah, sounds perfect. In my experience and from what I've seen, there's a few really common models, right? There is the straight up tiered model, which is, hey, we've got bronze, silver, gold, and what you get for those different tiers, which is why they're different prices, is not necessarily based on transactions or some other variable. It's based solely on the modules that you take from mm-hmm. that platform. So for example, with Zero, I'm a, I'm a subscriber to Zero. If you want you know, certain pieces of functionality in the platform, or if you need certain pieces of functionality in the platform, as you go up the tiers, you get added stacked functionality. Now with them, I don't really need, I don't need, for example, HR management. I don't Mm. need project management. I don't need all these other parts of zero to just run the financials of my business. So I'm at the lowest tier. And then in addition to that, they manage it. And this is a very common kind of add-on to that basic tiered pricing model of functionality is number of seats or number of users underneath that organization. And usually even that is tiered. So they might say, okay, here's tier bronze. It's got this basic platform functionality. And then with the base price, you get uh, one to five users included in that tier. Mm. Now, if you need additional modules or if you need additional users, then there's an add-on price per user. And then there's an add-on price per module that takes you up to the next tier. That is Mm. a very common, that's a very common use case for SaaS pricing. Then the other one is really what we would think of more as a consumption-based pricing, which is, Mm -hmm. okay, it's based on number of transactions it's based on gmv through the platform it's based on it's based on a number of consumption metrics maybe it's based on the number of api calls if it's a if it's an ipass middleware platform it's, it's literally based on the number of calls and usually in that model where there's a consumption based model there's also like a fixed minimum fee like there might be just to operate the platform just to provision your account to you might be they might have a base fee of say 200 bucks a month or 300 bucks a month or whatever it is just to keep the doors open so they have a guaranteed level of revenue to allow them to scale and then the consumptive element is is lumped on top and you usually see this in fintech platforms, this is the most common model for fintech platforms. They'll say, okay, to operate our payment gateway, it's, it's 200 bucks a month. And then, okay. and then we take a transaction fee on top of that. And it's a sliding scale up to a certain transaction volume through the platform. Mm-hmm. We're going to take, we're going to take 2%. Then if you, and then if you double that, we're going to take, you know, we're going to take 1.85%. And then it, it's a sliding scale to where the transaction percentage that they take off if you decreases with volume increases. So that's a very common model in fintech. Some of those have, that model is probably subject to more disruption in the sense that someone like Stripe, when almost every other payment gateway at the time had a minimum fee per month, which could be quite high if you're a startup. So for example, let's say you're an e-com startup and and you you literally in the first month, you're probably doing zero volume. Like Mm -hmm. until you get the marketing rolling and start generating traffic, 
that could end up being really expensive for an SMB. Right. And yes. companies like Stripe said, we're not going to, we're not charge you a fixed monthly fee plus transaction fees. It's just a straight transaction fee. So as you grow, we grow. So you've got no disincentive for signing up with them. Like there's, there's no downsides because they're, because their transaction fees are also competitive. I feel like that model's probably subject to a bit of disruption for anybody who doesn't charge a base fee and just charges a consumption based fee of some variety. I feel like that's probably the model that will win out in the long term because that straight consumption based model is no longer subject to any disruption. It just is what it is. There's no additional fees over that sort of base transaction fee, right? So these are really common. Where you start mm -hmm. to see more complexity is where it's a, there's a lot of platforms that have this unique complex blend, which is we're not straight transaction fee based, but we are band based. In other words, tier one, we're going to charge you up to this number of transactions through our website. We're going to charge you this base subscription fee and this base transaction fee. Right. And that puts you in bands of say number of orders from zero to 10,000 orders. This is the band you're in from 10,000 orders to 50,000 orders. This is the band you're in from 50,000 and above. This is the third band that you fall into. And okay, that usually, okay. that usually takes the form of again, it's just, it's slightly different to that straight base fee plus transaction fee. It's more, it, it takes into account more factors and puts them into bands basically is what it does. And on most of the e-commerce platforms do this. And basically what they do is they automatically force you. It just automatically happens. They move you into the next tier once mm. you move above a certain rolling number of orders. And, and it's usually rolling. And what I say by rolling is they don't just reevaluate it every 12 months from the date of sign up. They take the, the previous rolling 12 months. Once you hit the 12 month mark, then they take a rolling 12 month value and then they will escalate you up the tiers. If you in that in any preceding 12 months, you you exceed the bottom band or whatever mm -hmm. band you started in, then they will automatically move you up the tiers. And then basically your subscription price just goes up in tandem with the band that you're in. Okay. And usually what happens in that scenario is that so. In that scenario, they could either charge you a transaction fee at a fixed rate for the band, or there's no charge for the transactions, but they move you up the bands of number of included transactions at that subscription fee. Does that make sense? Yes, totally, totally, yes. And I've also uh, seen that in the past when working with different companies. But the first one that you mentioned also with Zero, I think you mentioned, where they have different tiers. I probably that is the most common one that also Shopify also has that those tiers and all right, understood. Interesting. Now, Jason, now. Oh, sorry, sorry. Just one quick yeah, thing. Sure. There's a, a key differentiation between the way Shopify does it and the way Zero does it. Zero does not dictate to you that you must move up another tier based on GMV or transactions through the platform or invoices generated. There's no consump fee that I'm aware of, unless they've introduced it recently. There's no, you're paying for seats and you're paying for functionality. That's mm -hmm. it. You could do a million through the platform or 50 bucks through the platform and you're going to pay that monthly fee whether you like it or not. With Shopify, they're mm -hmm. saying, okay, at a certain GMV level, right? You, so yes, in the case of Shopify Plus, it, it works a little bit more like zero, but they, but all those tiers, the, the added functionality is mostly illusory. Like it's it, okay. They'll throw in a little sweetener here and there, but it's mostly just comes down to GMV through the platform. And, and basically they're going to force you up the bands when you hit certain levels of GMV. And I think, I, I think from memory, I could have this wrong, but I think they force you onto Shopify plus at a million dollars. Once you hit a million dollars a year in GMV, I think that's when you're forced onto plus uh, maybe 10 million. I can't remember okay. the exact number. Mm, all right. Okay. Un understood. And if let's imagine a scenario, so I'm trying to paint a picture here, right? So let's imagine a, uh, a scenario, greenfield approach, startup, and maybe you don't want to take any previous models, right? That they're out there because it's either A or B, right? But when you want to really try, if, if you would like to, if you're, Objective is to gather new clients and let and gain experience in order to get to the best pricing out there because you wouldn't know that from day one, right? Correct. So, what would be maybe and what would be an approach that you would recommend? Also thinking maybe around pay as you go or, of course, free trials. Let you know putting that into a bucket because it's a trial period. 
but just in the greenfield approach, what is your recommendation or what have you also seen in the market and in your, from what you know? Yeah, look, I've seen the odd, really novel approach out there. There's even some situations where you pre-buy credits, basically, uh, to use on a consumption basis. So you might buy, you think of it like to where you almost have a digital wallet and it just takes money out of that digital wallet. You fund the digital wallet, say yes. off your credit card, you put a yes. thousand credits in there. Think of a photo website where you can log in and you can buy photos for your projects, etc. They mm -hmm. often work this way. So where you deposit a certain amount of credits with them, they don't They don't just not a subscription fee, although they usually have a sub subscription fee available as well. But if you're going to use the product infrequently or you don't know how much of the product you're going to use and you don't want to feel like I'm paying for something that I'm not using to its full potential. Okay, cool. I'm going to buy 100 credits and the price for images to download range from one to five credits each. Then I know, and I just see the wallet. I see the wallet value up in the corner of my screen and I always know how much credit I've got remaining in my wallet before I need to refund it. It's almost, it's almost prepaid cell phone bills, right? Okay, cool. I prepaid this credit in advance. I've got this much data with it. And then once I exceed that, then I either need to top up or I have to wait until it, it, it renews the next month. So there's, there is hybrid models like this, but I think that when startups in particular get too crazy with their models, it can sometimes be hard for the market to understand. And therefore yeah. it's hard for the market to accept. Okay. I believe, I'm an absolutely firm believer that the simpler the model, the more easy to understand, the easier it is for the customer to say yes. When I get to a SaaS platform, and I'm testing out new SaaS platforms all the time, it's crazy how many platforms I've got to test out for different things for my clients, for me, for my business, for their businesses. I'm just, I'm playing with SaaS platforms, particularly now with AI. I'm playing with a ton of, of SaaS platforms at the moment. And it scares me when I get to the pricing page And I can't immediately even understand it. Like if I can't, if they've got a matrix that's 25 lines long, so they've got three plans and then a matrix of 25 lines. And if I can't immediately detect what is the, the primary differences between those three tiers, I run a mile. Because if I can't understand the pricing model, I'm likely going to get screwed. Because I, I, if I can't explain it, then they can, and one of the, I'll tell you a platform right now that I think is doing this, that used to do it well, and is now doing it terribly since acquisition, and that is Slack. I tell you, I look at my Slack bill, and I literally mm -hmm. have zero idea, none whatsoever, why I'm getting charged when I'm, what, what I'm getting charged. It, it used to be really clear, like it was almost like a, a, a phone book, and it would have, okay, in this column, this was the workspace that you were in or whatever, here's the services that you used, here's what we charge per service, and then it would extend those line items out, and then you'd have a grand total at the bottom, like it was just super clear what you were paying for. Now I have no idea. I, I literally have no idea. So I can't tell you whether I'm getting good value out of Slack or not, but I, tell, I'm t I can tell you that I'm getting charged a shitload of money every month. And it really is starting to frustrate me that I have no idea what I'm actually getting for that or how, because I don't know what I'm getting. I don't know how to re reduce my bill. Is it because I'm connected to too many third party works because of projects that I'm collaboratively working on? Because now I get charged for that. I get charged mm. for being, it used to be free, but it's not anymore. But I don't know exactly what that costs me and, mm -hmm. and whether it's based on usage or if it's a fixed fee per month. I have no idea. And so this is an example of a company that went from a very simple subscription model mm -hmm. to one of the most complex subscription models you can possibly imagine. And yes. to the point, and, and that, that was clearly intentional. They wanted to opt their billing so that people would have no idea how to reduce their billing. And I think that AWS is the masters at this. It is so hard to tell <laughs> what you are paying for, wh you know, whether you could move to reserved instances and save money and how much it would save you. That's why optimized AWS billing SaaS businesses are springing up like weeds because mm -hmm. no one understands how to reduce their AWS bill without professional help and support. Because yes. I, I, I've tried, I've tried, I've run an AWS account before and I, I'm just like, I don't even know where to start. I, I really mm -hmm. don't. Uh, the best I could find is trying to move to reserved instances for everything that you think you're going to be able to consume over the long term. And that's about the best that I could figure out to do. But when you're talking about API platforms like Lambda and things like that, where it's not based You don't really get the reserved instance model. I don't know how to, I don't know how to reduce costs for uh, Lambda services, for example. There are some people that are expert in that and, and they can reduce their bill internally inside their business. But a lot of people and a lot of brands, they got to pay, say, a 25 buck 
a month fee or a 50 buck a month fee for a platform that plugs into your AWS account and does the cost optimization for you based on like your trailing 12 months usage. Hey team, I have a big favor to ask you. Please pause this episode and send the link of this episode to someone you know that you think would enjoy this content. Really appreciate you spreading the word. This is how we grow. We're not a Joe Rogan. We don't have big, massive advertising budgets, but we absolutely want to grow. We want to get the learnings from all of these episodes out to as wide of an audience as possible, and we need your help to do it. Thank you, and now back to your listening. Uh, absolutely, and great takeaways for me already. So basically, what you're saying is pricing should be very, it's, it should be simple, so that the customer can readily understand what am I getting for the bucks that I'm paying. And ideally, it should also stay as simple as possible. So you make the example with Slack, which is, which of course is very important also as you grow, basically, because customer frustration is at some point customers might leave and you want to know why. And if, even if you ask them to, I don't know, a survey or there's a, a few questions, choose why you want to leave us and you say pricing, it still doesn't tell you what part of the pricing they didn't like. Was it too expensive? Was it too intransparent? And so forth. So these are really interesting insights. The one that you mentioned, I liked it quite a lot where you mentioned that the prepayment, because this in a sense allows allows customers for a new platform to safeguard their, actually more than one thing. It does not only safeguard their expenses, it also saves, safeguards the length, the length of the contract, right? They must not be locked down in a one-year contract or whatever, right? It can be as long, as short as they consume the credits, right? Correct, and 100%. That's really good. That's really good. Actually, I like that. Let me give you, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I'll give you yeah, one sure. more example of a company that has recently raised their SaaS prices to me. And it, I was this close. There's actually two, there's actually two platform vendors, but I'll focus on one for now that raised their prices on me. And when they sent the email to advise of the next renewal price increase that, that it was going to hit the next subscription renewal, they painted it as though they were doing me a favor. They painted it as though this is going to reduce costs for, for, for a lot of people using our platform, whatever. Mm -hmm. But when I deconstructed it, and, and they didn't give me enough information in the email, they just basically said, trust us. We're dynamically going to look at your last 12 months of usage and put you on the most appropriate new plan based on your usage over the last 12 months. But what they didn't tell me is that the new plans don't have as low of a base as the old plans, meaning that the minimum that I was going to be mm -hmm. locked in for was much higher, even though I didn't need any of the new inclusions that came yeah. in the new plans. So they, mm -hmm. they added include, they added quote unquote free inclusions at every tier. But what they didn't tell you in the email is that for people like me who are one, you one single user of the platform, mm -hmm. and I didn't use any of their advanced features. I only used the most basic features of the platform. So including anything more in the lowest tier didn't help me at all. But now I was forced to basically get charged as if I had five users. Okay. And, and also forced to assume that I was going to do more transactions in a given month than I'd ever done in a peak month previously. So mm. that really, I, I actually, and even the tier that they were planning to put me in was mm -hmm. too much for when I looked at my previous usage over the previous 12 months. And then I compared that to the new plans. They had already put me in one plan higher than what I should have been in. And, and I was already going to be paying more for the one plan lower. So like that was, in, if they had just sent the email and just said, hey, we are restructuring our plans, this may affect the price you pay for our platform and just been really transparent and really honest based on your previous 12 months usage, we think you're going to fall into this plan and here's the price of the new plan. Like they didn't even tell you what the price of the plan was that they were mm. going to forcibly send you into. And I was like, wow, this is like the worst possible way to change yeah. your entire pricing model and change all of the inclusions of your pricing model and be totally non-transparent about it. I, I almost quit the plat. The, the challenge is, and I think they knew this, the challenge is I had been using the platform for so long. It was so deeply yeah. embedded in my workflows that it would be painful to change. So what yeah. I ended up doing, I said, I'll just move down to the very, very lowest tier and instead of the tier that you forcibly put me in. Yes, it's about mm. 
25 or 50 percent more expensive than it was before but it would probably take me more time and money to find a new platform than to just keep using yours at a higher cost but it just it left a really bad taste in my mouth that they were so non-transparent about what they were doing yeah because it almost feels like you're being screwed but as a customer you don't want to feel like that right you want to feel like okay i'm getting value out of the platform and okay it's okay to f pay a fair price and price increases are also okay when we go to the yeah. supermarket there are also price increases right when i buy a yeah. banana now for instance or apples doesn't matter right it's now more expensive than it, they used to be six months ago it's square up to a certain point right but don't school customers but exactly there's another takeaway don't screw customers <laughs> yes yes in a, in a nutshell don't screw your customers or, or at least if you're gonna screw them tell them that you're gonna screw them be honest about it and 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 try to use some lube would be the takeaway yeah. dear customer <laughs> we are about to hit you with, with new prices um okay, yeah. but price pricing pricing models should serve more than only more than only let's say the, per the perception of customers that they get a fair deal. It should also help you to achieve healthy margins. Now, what are healthy margins in e-commerce? Not and maybe it's a difficult question. Maybe there is no straight answer, but maybe we can construct a flow how to get to the point to have healthy margins, not based on the transactions, based on Basically, there are different models, but I try to stay away from models because they re they constrain you in the way you think, right? And when you think about healthy margin um, margins, of course, there are different consideration factors, right? Uh, number of people that work for your company, your bills and whatever, cost, cost plus basing or cost plus. But are there references in the e-commerce space that you know of about healthy margins when excluding Ideally, excluding transactions, transaction fees is what I'm talking about. Yeah, I, I haven't really looked into like quarterly filings of public companies that are popular SaaS platforms to see what the average margin amongst them is. But one thing, there's two things that I know for certain. One is multiples of valuations when you are talking a, say, for example, a retailer versus a SaaS business. The multiples for SaaS are like, it depends on what phase of the market cycle you're in and how much profitability they're making. But we have seen historically SaaS multiples be 25, 30, sometimes stupidly 50, 60 times revenue. And that could be the multiples of a SaaS business in terms of valuation. Now, I think those are coming crashing back down, especially the non-profit profitable niche SaaS businesses. They're not as valuable as they used to be because so many of them have gone out of business without continuation funding. But when we look at traditional retail, they want to start out. They want to start out with 50% gross. That's like the target for most retailers. It's we need to start out with 50% gross because by the time we strip all the other costs out of the business, it's going to net us somewhere. Again, depends on the business, but anywhere from 10 to 25% net, right? And so that's usually a sustainable business. And but I think with SaaS, I think the challenge is that where you're at in your life cycle is going to determine how much margin. And if you're not running a cost plus model, which I don't encourage any brand, any business, any agency, any consultant, I don't recommend that anyone run a cost plus model because it doesn't take into account the value proposition yes. that you bring to the table. You're Thank effectively you. getting, really? you're, you're eventually almost, you're really just making a fixed margin in your business and as and your costs go up. it's very much inward you, looking, right? It's inward looking. You look, you build something for customers, but then you say, hey, but let me look at my own cost and say, okay, this is what I'm going to charge you. Yeah. And what but if the you're the first care? to market, what, 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 yeah, there's two market dynamics that should affect this. One is what will the market bear versus what, what do we bring to the table? If we're one of one in what we do, then we have a lot more leverage to be able to charge more. Whereas if we're, for example, let's say we're talking Magento, Shopify, Big Commerce, Vtex, and, and a couple of other kind of mainstream e-commerce platforms, mm -hmm. they don't have very much cost leverage, meaning that they all have to be within CUI of each other because they're all targeting a similar mid-market to low enterprise. They're targeting a very similar target customer demographic. And as a result of that, they don't have outside pricing power. 
they have outsized pricing power in some respects and in some ways, maybe in very niche use cases that only they serve. But broadly speaking, they do not have outsized pricing power. Yes, you still have uh, Strata in there where obviously somebody like Magento and Adobe, they're going to be way more expensive than your average SaaS platform, for example, because they're self-hosted. And oh God, there's a lot of other reasons. But the reality is that you have pricing power when you do not go into a red ocean competitive environment. If you can somehow create a blue ocean competitive environment where you either have none or very few direct competitors, then all of a sudden now the value that you bring to the table is so unique that you can, I, I don't want to say you, you can price whatever you like because there's always alternatives, not direct replacements, but there's always a way around what you do, maybe with a different solution. So there's a there's mm, ton of complementary mm. solutions. I wouldn't say yeah. direct replacements, but there's alternatives, right? And you will never have total pricing power. And even if you did, you probably wouldn't want to use it because you want to hit a certain volume. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that the closer you can get to total uniqueness, the better your pricing model will become over time because it's like Uber, right? Uber discounted so heavily mm -hmm. through VC funding when they started out. That, and the sole goal of that, same as Amazon, mm -hmm. their sole goal, which was to run an intentional loss to grab so much market share yes. that when they were market dominant, mm -hmm. then they could just tweak their pricing model just a little bit and instantly turn themselves into a, a profitable juggernaut, right? And so that's what that's the type of model we should be aiming for is that, and if you can get to a place where you're at least covering costs, once you become the default solution in a category or segment, that's mm -hmm. when you can lever up your profitability. Now, you're going to alienate, no question. You are going mm -hmm. to piss off and you are going to alienate. Anytime you make a pricing increase of any description, mm -hmm. you are going to alienate customers and they will if they can easily find an alternative, they will make that jump, right? But if you've got a sticky system and a sticky platform that requires, say, integrations and all these other things, they may not like it, but they'll probably stay as long as you present other value. Now, I'm going to give you another example. I was a beta user of Opus Clip before they started charging, and it was free. And so I didn't know what they were eventually going to charge when they went to – because I knew they were not going to stay free forever. It was way too much value to, to stay free forever because I was just – waiting for that email. I was just waiting for that login to say, okay, our free plan is no longer free. Here's your base plan. And I was expecting them, A, to have multiple tiers, and B, I was expecting it to, to be really expensive, and C, I was expecting that they would increase prices over time pretty rapidly, mm -hmm. right? So I was expecting all those things to happen because I just felt the platform was too good and they could easily take advantage of customers as a result. But an interesting thing happened in the market, in the intervening time, there was a few other platforms that had started doing something similar to what they did. Maybe not quite as good, maybe not quite as user-friendly, but, but it was included with some other full-spectrum video editing platforms. And I knew that they would eventually probably catch up to around Opus Clip's capabilities. But the other thing was, when they forced me to pay, first of all, I ponied up literally the first day that they had the pricing model on there. I was happy to pay. Pricing was fair. Okay. There was no multiple tiers. There was just month-to-month -month or annual. And you okay. even on man, annual, you would, I think, no, I think I paid for the full 12 months up front because it was so cheap. But that was the only difference. You could go month to month or you could have annual and you include, they included all their features. There was no tiering of features. You got everything in the kitchen sink for the one fee. And I was like, this is fair. This is transparent. It's cheap. Why wouldn't I? Mm -hmm. Then what they did something very fucking smart. Literally every single month since that day that I signed up, they have sent me an email with all the new product enhancements that they've done during that month and released. And they said, when you log in, you're going to see this. When you log in, you're going to see this. And Oh, uh, and they didn't mention anything about money. It's not, oh, we're going to charge you more now. Or, oh, we've got this new tier so okay. you can do this function. They just said, this is included as part of your base subscription, but we just wanted to let you know all these new things that we're doing to make it more useful to you based on your feedback as a customer. And so I, I, I feel better if they were in 12 months time from now, they were to come back to me and say, Jay, sorry, you know, our costs have increased and we, we need to at least cover our costs to be a sustainable business. Hey, we, we're having to bump our plan cost up to this per, per year. And the next time you renew eight months from now, you're, you, that's our new annual fee. It's the new annual fee. Here it is. I would have no problem with that because they've set the stage for me to go, not only do you have base costs that have risen for you, but you've also introduced 12 months worth of enhancements that didn't cost me a thing extra. Man, no brainer to renew. I'm very happy to renew. And I actually, it makes me proud to be an early supporter of your platform because I can tell people I was a beta user even before this product went public. So mm -hmm. 
Yeah, look, I, I think there's a right way and a wrong way to do pricing model changes or pricing changes themselves in SaaS. Okay, because it's a very good point that you mentioned, because that actually that would um, be my final question for today, is beta users, right? Somehow, I somehow I don't want to. I told you that I want I, that I'm going to launch a new product, right, or a new feature, right? And now the question is how to introduce that into the market, and there needs to be a certain customer base to also get feed so that I can get feedback. And the question is how to go about it, right? And that's why also SaaS pricing, combinations of different models, and ultimately having users or test users, beta users, whatever you name it. Now, how to go about introducing that? Because it should not, would you lay out the terms from the beginning? Say, yet you can test for free for six months or not say anything and say, hey, you can use it up to the point where we change our pricing model. How should we, how can be the communication in two ways to it, to attract the users, number one, but also when you want to change your price or when you will charge at some point for it? Yeah, I'll tell you, in the case of Opus Clip, they never said on their website that, hey, we're working towards a, a production release. We're still in beta test phase. We're working towards a production release. And when we hit production release, we're actually going to start, we're, we're going to start charging for our platform. They, did, they didn't message it that way at all. And I think this is, this would probably be harder to do if they were already in production mode. And then they said, I can't remember if they've replaced that. Let me just go to Opus real quick here. I wonder if they even still give a free, because you can go month to month with the platform. I don't think they even offer a try before you buy. Yeah, let me just see here because it's taking me to the login screen, of course, because I have an account. But I think if I was to, let me just go in incognito. Let me just see. I think they require you to at least sign up, even if they have a free plan. Opus plan. Let me just see here. Pricing. Let's see here. Free forever plan. Okay, so they still offer that. After your free essential trial ends, enjoy continued use of Opus Clip with our free forever plan, 60 minutes free uploads, upload minutes per month, create a free account. Okay, so they still have a free for that that's recent because I didn't even know that they still had a free forever plan, but it's limited and they also have I think a free trial in addition to that. Uh, but, I, but I don't know because I already have an account so when I log in it doesn't allow me to have that. And it says they've also added a new thing there that they're adding a pro plan available in December. It says for professional creators, editors, agencies, content marketers, credits from the yearly essential plan will be upgraded into the pro plan credits at no additional cost. Enterprise plan, have requests on APIs, large volumes, blah, 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 contact us. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, they've purely got a monthly and a yearly plan. That's it. But what I, what I will tell you they did do when, because I was one of the first people to move from the, the free beta test plan to a paid plan, mm -hmm. what they said is, hey, when you sign up, we're going to give you, I, I can't remember exactly what the number was, but I think they doubled my minutes of available upload time for six months or 12 months or something like oh, that. Wow. They basically, they didn't give me a dollar value discount. They didn't say, okay, we're going to give you 25% off when you subscribe. Mm -hmm. But what we're going to do is we're going to give you more value in terms of the allocation of free upload minutes per month included with the plan. We're going to like double that for you for yes. a period of time as one of our first subscribers. So that made okay. me feel that made me feel even better because I didn't expect to get anything extra mm -hmm. when I started paying for my plan. I didn't expect anything extra. So they gave me extra minutes. They gave me extra value. Even though I was paying the same price as everyone else, they gave me extra value as a result. Okay. So I think anytime you can present extra value for people that move off of a free to a paid plan, I think that's because the reality is that anybody that migrates from a free plan to a paid plan, they're probably a fan. They're probably a fan because yeah, if they saw like, enough yeah. value to start paying, even after you know, trialing the platform for free, they probably really like the product. Otherwise, they would keep looking, right? They'd mm -hmm. keep looking for a different product. So I think no matter how you do it, whether you have a free forever plan, a really basic one, but don't do whatever you – don't do what Loom just did, which is ever since – because they're about ready to try to go public and, mm -hmm. and there's lots of things with them. But They need to sweeten up their numbers, right? Yes. So what they did is in the beginning, their free forever plan had all the functionality. 
right? All the functionality of the platform. Then they started tiering not just their pricing, but their functionality. And they started progressively dropping more and more functionality of the free plan. So sure, you still get a free account. And sure, you can do some basic creation. But they, they and the, the recent one that canned it for me, that forced me to start looking for a new platform that was an equivalent of theirs was when they started blocking downloads of the visit videos you had created. You only could you could only send the link to people. You couldn't actually download the video and, and use it for anything and internal projects like an internal wiki or anything like that. You, you, you weren't able to do that. And so I was using those videos on the free plan because I wasn't shooting long videos. I wasn't shooting lots of videos. I was shooting one at a time that could be deleted afterwards. And mm. they were under 60 seconds each. And all of a sudden now I couldn't download them and using it, use them in any project. I was like, you say you're free, but now there's so few features for free that it's basically, it's free in name only. You pretty much, yes. in order for the plan to be usable, you need to be on a paid plan. Mm. Yeah. All right. No, but this gives me a lot of, or this session gave me a lot of insights and also new ideas for the upcoming product. Really excited because here this, now I have much more, let's say, you, look, you mentioned some products, some players out there in the market that I can now look at and see, okay, this, this is really something that was good that you like. For instance, I can benchmark, look a little bit around, compare, understand what they offer, what they don't, and their various plans and also different pricing models that, that they have and experiment and yeah, ready to engage into this topic and deep, di and deep dive. If you'd like to get mentored by Jason for free, head over to greenwoodconsulting.net, scroll to the bottom of the page and click Get Mentored by Jason.